Welcome to the Live Up Podcast, where we revisit the movies from our youth to see if they live up. I'm Jess Latterman. And I'm Amanda Treat. And before we start today's episode, I wanted to apologize for some strong language I used during our Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer episode to describe Santa Claus. It was actually directed at the creators of that stop motion movie, uh, How not could at you, Santa. Amanda? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of our younger listeners has brought it to my attention that you should not talk about Santa like that. So my sincere apologies. I still think the people who created Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer are a bunch of jerks for making him say all those things, but We'll save that for uh, if we ever revisit we'll that We'll save episode. that for a part two. Uh, yes. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, I will say, no, I am not on Santa's naughty list. I uh, <laughs> got a new microphone for Christmas. So thank you, Santa. Doesn't thank you, Santa. sound like I'm calling from a phone booth in the Australian Outback anymore. So that's exciting. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are upping our game here, guys, that live up uh, <laughs> and apologizing to our young listeners. Just our <laughs> um, but oh, before okay. we get started, uh, just to quickly review for those new to us, um, you know, how, how this goes. So we're going to discuss the movie in question, then each score on a scale of one to 10, whether the movie lives up to us now as adults whether it can live up to kids now or at least the intended audience. And then both of us will give a final yay or nay, whether it lives up. So let's dive in. Would you like, would you like to talk about the Adams family, Amanda? I would love to talk about the Adams family and just uh, to clarify, because there's a lot of these movies now, but this is the 1991 live human, not cartoon <laughs> version of the Adams family. I am the one who picked this one, and I picked it because a lot of us have been watching Wednesday, the TV series on Netflix, which is fantastic. Um, Completely fantastic. I loved it. Yeah. So while I was watching that, there were a lot of just kind of flashbacks, not quite comparisons, but, you know, looking at how Catherine Zeta-Jones was playing Morticia versus I had this memory of Angelica Houston playing Morticia and... It just got me thinking a lot about this movie and how fantastic I thought this movie was too. Uh, back, especially when I saw it uh, opening weekend as a kid in the movie theater and how I can't believe that you was. remember seeing it opening weekend. I'm oh, so yeah. impressed. It was great. Um, so we decided to rewatch this, and I had to know: Does the Adams Family from 1991 live up to my memory of it? So <laughs> let's dive in. Jess, did you watch this as a kid? Uh, I did. I don't remember specifically if I saw it in the theater. I must have, though. I found that even when I was rewatching it, it was really the, all I remembered about the movie was essentially Angelica Houston and the character of Morticia and Wednesday. So it's somewhat burned into my memory. It's almost like my memory and attachment to it is really just essence of Angelica Houston, I think. She's but, fantastic in this. Fantastic. I keep using the word fantastic too much, but I know there's so many words. I have to think of more words to describe <laughs> Angelica Houston as as Morticia. Oh, stunning. But, she is stunning. Stunning. That's a good one. You know, laughing at jokes that aren't supposed to be funny and not, that aren't slapstick. So I mean most of that came from Angelica, Velvety Angelica Houston. <laughs> But amazing. So wait, tell me about opening weekend. So you actually have a memory of seeing it. So I remember. It. So I think I remember seeing this movie on it had to be Thanksgiving weekend because it just had that vibe of we've gotten through a holiday and then you have that long weekend and your parents don't quite know what to do with you. So I'm pretty sure that's when my family went to the theater to see this movie and just when the lights went down and this movie starts it's got those christmas carolers and they're just like a touch too cheerful and it's a little annoying but okay and as as all christmas carolers are <laughs> to be honest and there's my the long island dew coming out Ooh, <laughs> fighting words <laughs> um the camera just starts slowly tilting up the length of this creepy old house and then you get to the top and there's the family standing there with a giant cauldron of boiling oil that they're about to pour down on the carolers <laughs> and that was the moment where I was like yes I am in 100% for this movie like this is going to be sarcastic and macabre and weird and like dark dark humor 
And yeah, it was just, it made me so happy. It was like, we're starting with the medieval warfare on Christmas. <laughs> I didn't know you when you were 11 years old because we didn't meet till much later, but I think that you essentially were Wednesday as oh, a kid. <laughs> Christina Ricci's <laughs> And you're like, this movie's for me. They're yeah, I was like, powerless. I want to make this a personality. This is so <laughs> funny to me. <laughs> I mean, she, I remember her more than Angelica Houston, uh, just because I think she's closer in age to us. Um, so we're watching and she was the character I really latched on to. But she just delivers the funniest lines with such a straight face. And I thought that was just such a great personality. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, yeah I definitely was. And I think everyone in the 90s, the early 90s, especially like, you know, you had that like Janine Garofalo delivery on everything where it was just like something really cutting with a deadpan and like that was yeah. just the vibe of the times, but it I love it. It is the vibe it. of the times. <laughs> That's such a good call because then you, later you have the animated Daria series on MTV, oh, yeah. which I think is more mid '90s, but it's in the same vein. She's yes. just she's like a Wednesday Adams without the murder, but um, yeah, not that she's murdering people, but you know what I mean. Without oh, the they, well, maybe they might be bodies <laughs> buried back there in the cemetery. <laughs> um. So yeah, I just I mean, this was feeling like I was being transformed into like an Edward Gorey or transported rather into an Edward Gorey cartoon. Like it was just dark and macabre and weird and just completely out of reality. And I loved it so much. It was just so Did much fun to be there. Love that scene as much this, as an adult. Cause I, when I was, I watched this with my kids, which was fine. They, and we'll talk more about that, but they were kind of confused about the Christmas carolers. And then they're like, what are they doing? <laughs> Not that that was a bad thing. But... Yeah, I mean, it does take you right into like what this movie's going to be. Like the jokes are going to be really dark and everybody is constantly on the cusp of dying. But like somehow within this house or on the property, you can get electrocuted and not die. And somehow. everyone just laughs about it. You know, they're poisoning each other. They're stabbing each other. <laughs> just like, yep, laugh at them. This is fun. <laughs> Yeah, you no, have to suspend of... your uh, cringy, like, oh my god, that's gonna, that's not a way, like, to parent your children. You just gotta let it go. Yeah, this isn't exactly a family that has like outlet protectors for when their kids are young. Uh, oh, they kind of would no. be like, yeah, sure, stick your finger in that, stick a fork in this that. fork is sharper. Here, use this one. <laughs> Here, use this. See what happens. It's, do you remember the reaction in the theater itself when that was happening or not really just your own like I mean I, I'm imagining a giant like dark light bulb going over your head like I am Wednesday Adams <laughs> possibly for me I mean people I remember people were laughing like the jokes landed the way they're supposed to you didn't yeah. get like anyone clutching their pearls in the theater like oh how could they do that like yeah and man I never wish actually I show people getting hit with hot oil even though that's implied so I think that helps out a little bit too is they imply <laughs> a lot of really bad things but they don't actually show it right which I think makes it kind of more fun anyway yeah. um well <laughs> Uh, just for those who uh, maybe don't remember the movie, I'll give a very, very quick uh, overview of the plot, which I feel like the plot is like not exactly that important in this movie. <laughs> but it's you have the Adams family. So they're basically just living their authentic life in their own Adams family way. Gomez, played by Raul Julia, he's forever searching for his brother Fester, uh, mostly via seance for some reason. Um, and the family lawyer finance person, Tully, who's played by Dan Hedaya, I think I'm pronouncing that right. He devises a scheme with another client where his client's son poses as Uncle Fester, who's finally returned, claims his inheritance, and then basically then would steal the Adams family money and property. I mean, like I said, that's the plot. But I, I mean, even watching it, I was like, I don't remember the money scheme at all. Like that was not in my memory. And I don't even think it was that important. No. I think it was more the movie itself is the Adams family in my mind. Like that's essentially the movie and them walking through all the, you know, Adams family type things that they do. But yeah, so that's the overview of the plot. I don't know if I missed anything, but no, that's pretty much it. I remember as a kid because they do try to make it unclear like is this actually the real uncle fester returning is it not is he just a con artist and it flips back and forth a lot and i remember as a kid being very confused like is he or isn't he but they do 
sort of slapped on an ending where they're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, right. Let's yeah, clarify this. And I heard, I was reading from the original script. The original script didn't actually say whether it was him for certain and that the actors all sort of petitioned the director and said, oh, really? hey, I think this really needs to be him. And they made Christina Ricci go argue the case for it. Like all the adults. Oh, really? They're like the cute little kid over to be like, I think he should be my uncle. In my memory, uh, now as an adult, I didn't even occur to me as a kid. I remember thinking this as I was rewatching it that uh, it almost didn't matter. But of course, it was Uncle Fester. Like in, in a way, it didn't. Re I mean, it's fine that they resolved it. But... There is something kind of funny about the idea of a con artist pretending to be Uncle Fester and then liking it so much that he's like, "Yeah, all right, I'll just sure, I'll be it. Uncle Fester. I can do this for the rest of my life." <laughs> but yeah. I'm glad they went the way they did with it and. And clarified it so thank you for being a it. Probably, it probably is good for kids but that is somehow through the years or decades it sort of fell out of my memory and then just didn't matter anymore oh. but um we should also mention uncle fester played by christopher lloyd and this might just be his finest role i mean he was fantastic he's so fester. good at it <laughs> so That's, good i, I don't want to knock my uncle <laughs> yeah i remember got to the episode where uncle fester appears and it's fred armison from saturday night live and documentary now and i mean he does so many things but i was comparing him the whole time to christopher lloyd's performance of uncle fester and like i hate to fault fred armison for anything but i was just like he's no christopher lloyd like i don't know yeah the, the yeah. physical comedy and the gravelly voice I, there's just something so funny and endearing about christopher lloyd's so version endearing. of uncle fester I had rewatched the Adams Family before I watched the Wednesday show, and I did the same thing with Uncle Fester. I was I, I did the same thing with Angelica Houston too, because or with the Morticia character. Um, I think in my mind now Morticia just is Angelica Houston. They're one and the same, really. Yeah. Um, they, but we, let's, they're the let's same get, person. <laughs> before we go, <laughs> and I don't think we'll spend this whole podcast comparing to Wednesday. Uh, people could do that on their own time, but um, so let's let's get into the characters. Should we start with our favorite? character i'm just gonna make Let's you a start with morticia. maybe we have different favorites no our Mort favorite, i mean Amanda? who is it <laughs> as a kid it was absolutely wednesday but i think as an adult god i appreciate angelica houston delivers such a performance like she somehow is as crazy as the rest of them but just so genuinely nice like she's a very nice neighbor and she's like helping with the charity auction she goes to teach the preschool and they need money <laughs> like she's just like a very nice person but then at the same time she is so sexy and i am saying that as <laughs> like she is amanda is not the gay one on this no <laughs> she's not the gay co-host <laughs> but like she it struck me this time uh do you remember back there used to be that or i think she's still around that character elvira oh yeah who used to she had her own movies or she opens the like when they do movie marathons i think we were slightly Halloween too young stuff. for that at yeah the time, but i remember it but yeah. it struck me that she's wearing the same exact outfit it is somehow so much trashier like so there's something trashier. very <laughs> elegant about morticia even though she's it's the same outfit it's so it's just whatever she's doing whatever angelica houston is doing is morticia she is just like hitting so many notes, just so it's such a fine line and she's like perfect at it. So perfect. this is, yeah, she's definitely like an astounding performance in this. And I, I thought she was fabulous. Like every time she's on screen, they have her lit like an old Hollywood star. Like they're just perfectly lighting her face and it's like so sultry and like smooth. Oh my God. Yeah, she looks amazing. She acts amazing. Like everything about this character is awesome. I think she made the movie and I think she must have made the movie to me as a kid too. Let's we'll set the gay thing aside <laughs> for me, <laughs> but I think, but I think she's just that good as Morticia. Like it's and you're totally right. She's completely perfect. And my favorite is, and every line she delivers is amazing. I, you know, no matter what the scene is, Oh yeah. And this person cho chose George W. Bush and, and she was an Angelica Houston retorts. Well, have you talked to her parents? And I just, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so perfect. perfect i forgot how funny she is in this because it's so it's so subtle and it's so genuine like she really seems like a concerned parent like there's a few minutes later um there she's sort of friends with the lawyer's wife margaret alford 
um there's a scene at the concert where margaret's like wiping her kid's nose and like the kid just looks so annoyed and the mother margaret goes oh you're so cute i could just eat you and where she, she just turns to her it's so sincere and she's like no he's too young <laughs> no, it's like just lands so perfectly like it, she's so not good. even a hint of irony like you just you know no no he's too young <laughs> I know the deadpan humor that the like every single line is so good and I think it's still sort of a little my daughter is almost 11 it's it landed with her oh, maybe good. not as much now as an adult but it's I mean the lines were just great and when she you had mentioned earlier when she's teaching Angel I keep calling her Angelica Houston to me they're like one <laughs> and the same Morticia Angelica Houston whatever when she's teaching pre-k because this is at this point in the plot you know they had you know been kicked out of their house and they have to make money so you has to work. i think you correctly identified it when they go into schitt's creek mode yes they're stuck yes. in the motel because they've been evicted from their mansion exactly and it, basically when she has to work as a pre-k teacher and she's reading the hansel uh and gretel story and they get to the point where where it's the happy ending and they like push the witch into the oven and hansel and gretel get to escape yay and morticia i guess i have to call her morticia not angelica Houston. <laughs> she was just like well what do you think that feels like? Poor witch, she gets pushed into the oven and the kids are just like wide-eyed and start And one crying. of them just starts wailing. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> it's so good. And I think especially now as a parent, I, you know, you read, you embellish these kids' stories when you read to them and to have basically that same tone in her voice, but taking the witch's perspective is so, was so funny to me. And I think that landed a bit with my kids, maybe not my son who's five, but it, it, the humor gets across at all ages, I think. The <laughs> one bit that made me laugh really hard that she said, and I'm cutting to the end here and, you know, spoilers people, but this movie came Spoiler. out in 1991. So I think we're all okay. <laughs> also, we said the plot doesn't really matter here. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, it's sort of like Rudolph. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> what they're doing <laughs> but uh at the moment when they've been evicted and morticia sort of looks around at her family looking very sad in the motel room decides to take action she's going to go talk to fester so she goes back to the house and essentially gets kidnapped by the evil lawyer and his bad client the con artist who's pretending to be a psychologist but they put her on the rack which you know they just have lying around the house as, and as one does <laughs> this is supposed to be like the dark night of the soul moment like oh my god she's in grave danger except we know that nothing bad really happens to people in this house and they put her on the rack and they start to stretch her and she just turns to him and goes oh you've done this before <laughs> and <laughs> that was so good, so it funny. kills me it's so <laughs> funny but and it completely undercuts it's like no she's not really in danger here <laughs> like she's gonna be fine like <laughs> We are racing to the finish line here with like, you know, her husband's charging over to come fight a sword fight and save her. But like, she's not really in pain. <laughs> like, she's fine. Right. And even if she is in pain, she likes the pain. She seems and to enjoy it. So she seems to enjoy it. Yeah. And a lot of those undertones, I think, went over my head, I'm sure, as a kid um, or tween, I guess, when we were watching this. But as an adult, they're just, they're just so perfect. Oh they're so God. funny. Uh, and you're totally right. It, it definitely sort of, is like the antidote to any kind of danger. Like, is something gonna ha bad gonna happen to this character? Um, and of course it doesn't. Because yeah. <laughs> she sort of likes the It's just like, hey, I would have done this anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> we get stretched on Thursdays. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh. No, she was just, I mean, I could go on and on, but I, I even like went and looked up like. I think I Googled, did Angelica Houston win an Oscar for playing Morticia? She got a Golden Globe so nomination and just rewatching this performance because it's just so perfect. It seemed like such a perfect, comedic, subtle performance. Yeah, I mean, and I, I mean, I generally speaking think Angelica Houston's a fantastic actress, even outside of this movie. But rewatching this just reminded me just... I, I just don't think this movie would have been terrible without her. I mean, I guarantee it would have been terrible without her. I think all of these actors actually are kind That's of above true. the pay grade of this film. Like this movie is very silly and lots of fun, but like 
even Raul Julia, I mean, he's brought so much energy to this. And like a lot of the side characters are like these Tony Award winning actresses. And like they have this powerhouse cast going on in here doing the most yeah, really silly do. things they can come up with. <laughs> and it works. It all works. It's great. Yeah. Well, what do you think? So Raul Julia is Gomez Adams, the other the other half of of the couple or the the leads for the Adam family. I guess we'll call them. I don't even know what to call them. <laughs> yeah. No, I I thought he was perfect too for this role. Um, I didn't grow up watching the TV show and I wasn't really familiar with the original. It's a comic, I think, right? I am not familiar with it either. I think there might have been a cartoon when we were younger. Okay. But um this so is I, this for people our age, this yes. this is I think people's reference points yeah. for sure. No, for me, I think think because when I watched Wednesday it was like oh I love Luis Guzman but like he's no Raul Julia but I think uh the Wednesday version is more true to what the TV show was that you had sort of a lower energy I'm gonna say uh <laughs> yeah. version of Gomez Raul Julia is just bouncing off the walls I mean he is <laughs> like shooting and with a sword <laughs> fighting people and yeah just like crazy energy that he brought into this he is so flirtatious with Morticia and that I thought worked really well. Like the two of them are ridiculous together, but like you believe it. <laughs> you totally believe it. it oh. Yeah, they they are ridiculous together. I, I don't think that, um, I agree with you. Like it's not just Angelica Houston. She had a partner in acting on the other side that was really fun and they completely worked. Yeah, I mean, he plays it like Raul Julia, for those who don't remember, he's, and you know, may he rest in peace. But he plays very he's a very suave leading man in this yes. in some ways. I mean, even though it's silly, like he's like sword fighting and you know, he could dance when he's got big, you know, tango he, with a rose in his teeth kind of vibe. He, he totally <laughs> and he's swashbuckling exactly through that house and it's just <laughs> nuts. Little Pepe Le Pew, but not as like a salty. So question way. though, because he just seems impervious to everything from reality until they leave the house but we'll get into that in a minute yeah he is ignoring like the law he's ignoring recommendations from people he's hitting all those golf balls at his neighbor which frankly <laughs> as an adult I was like okay that's kind of like what an asshole neighbor like I know he's putting golf balls neighbor. through his neighbor's house is he sort of a sociopath though do you think like I don't know he's just not affected by anyone's opinion of him and what he's supposed to be doing like he just does whatever he feels like I you know I saw that you put that in the notes and I was like huh until until I read that in there I was like I never thought I just thought of him as like well I guess this is what happens when you're rich you just become <laughs> completely impervious to reason <laughs> maybe it's just a rich person not a, just a rich person <laughs> yes <What's laughs> this, is what, this is what rich people do they hit golf balls at their neighbor and they have sword fights and they have no idea like what they do with their time is that's essentially what they do with their time they sword fight and and hit golf balls and dance the tango with like a rose in their teeth with their spouses I mean I guess I think he's more just wealthy and therefore completely unaware <laughs> is how I read him he's got an entire room in his basement full of doubloons of all things a like pirate <laughs> treasure <laughs> that you can only reach by taking like a gondola through their underwater canal like oh my god it's just so fun inside that house I I've forgotten all of that I remember the house being like a fun house of horrors yeah but like yeah the, the specificity of you know the the classic like library book moves and then you go into a secret place. You have to pull the exact chain to get down the tunnel. And just for those who don't remember, there's a vault underneath the house that has all the riches, if you will. And and, and you're right, and a Venetian is, canal. And then and, right, and a Venetian <laughs> canal. I know it's sort of Willy Wonka like. I think I thought about you know Willy Wonka kind of when they were doing that. And that's where part of the plot like doesn't matter. I mean, in when you're going through that house with him, he's taking when Fester returns. And he's taking his brother who he missed like, oh, you remember with which chain to pull? And he's like, ha, ha, ha. And meanwhile, Fester's like, oh, wait, or Gordon, the, the is it the con artist or is it Fester? Is trying to find out where all the goods are kept so he can go steal it later. And, you know, he just kind of along for the ride. But it's, it, and Gomez is like completely like nonplussed by the fact that like clearly Fester has like no idea what's going on um, <laughs> as they're going through and clearly has no memory of this. But he sort of plays along. I feel like it's sort of like a good tour through the house, but 
again, the plot of Fester trying to get to the money almost doesn't matter. <laughs> I think <laughs> like, for Fester, he really becomes a character when he starts bonding with the kids. You know, he's yeah. not connecting well with his brother because he may or may not be the actual brother but when he starts playing with the kids and I mean he's got he's teaching them about poisoning and explosives and like he just has to as, as every doing all... uncle does oh my god he's like the fantastic. original drunkle he would be so much fun as an uncle <laughs> he would be <laughs> but yeah he just really connects well with the two kids in the family and yeah is having them do incredibly dangerous things as uncles do but yeah, you just, that's the moment where you're like, well, even if he isn't, I really want him to be Fester, so. Right, yeah, that's where he gets, like, so endearing, and there's that part, again, in the plot that doesn't matter, um, and we'll get to the scene later where he wants to go to the recital for the kids, um, and, you know, his mom, who is also his, by meaning Gordon's, the the con artist side of Fester, um, his uh, co-conspirator, if you will, is like, you can't do that. They're out of the house. You're going to have to go rob all the things now. And, you know, he ends up going to the recital anyway. So it's, it's basically him, you know, being charmed by the kids and the kid. It, it is kind of sweet in a weird way. I, yeah. I didn't with him and we're jumping all over the place here but I think as a kid they explain initially from the con artist point of view like we're going to tell the Adams family that Fester has amnesia and it comes out at the end oh wait it was Fester he really did have amnesia but there's this shot of him getting struck by lightning in the head and I think I completely missed that as a kid I had no memory of that no memory but that's what's supposed to like bring his memory back um yeah so yeah again it wasn't important <laughs> yeah it just sort of wasn't which I think sort of there's I could pick a part too where like you know the plot is so unimportant that I like it's full of holes obviously yeah <laughs> but the dialogue is so good I go back and forth on like is this a great screenplay or not because um the woman who wrote this her name is Caroline Thompson she's one of the co-writers there's multiple writers here but she also wrote uh, Edward Scissorhands, which is oh such a God, great movie. That makes so much sense. And yeah. The Nightmare Before Christmas. So she's definitely oh got, even though Tim Burton had nothing to do with this movie originally, right. although they asked him to direct it and he passed. And oh, now he's back doing Wednesday. You know, I just assumed that Tim Burton had directed it. Even I know Tim Burton now directed the current yeah. show on Netflix Wednesday, but I just assumed that he had directed this and I was sort of surprised because it's so in his style. I was it's actually so looking at his vibe. Yeah. Yeah. The director actually, I'm sure you know more than me on this, when he went on, was this Bar Barry Sonnenfeld went on to work with the Coen brothers. And, you know, he directed Men in Black and Get Shorty. Get Shorty is, like, also another very funny, I Get Shorty. great movie. Um, and Schmigadoon, the TV show, which I watched and I thought was amazing. So this kind of deadpan, fish out of water type movies that clearly he, clearly he's a master of deadpan. <laughs> <laughs> but this yeah. is his first uh, movie that he directed. Oh, really? I yeah, previously he was a cinematographer. And I was reading that during this filming they lost a lot of the crew for some reason, but they lost their cinematographer. And so he just finally was like, I'll do both. And oh, right. I mean, that does make perfect sense. Cause I, you know, if you're a director with cinematography experience, it's like, yeah, why not be the director of photography now? That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. He did a great job for first movie, but this movie has no plot. <laughs> so it has no plot, but let's get to your other favorite character. I mean, I guess she was my other favorite one too. Yeah. Okay. Maybe so gush. Let's Christina start the gushing for someone Ricci else. as Wednesday. Oh my God. Like oh my God. The best character of my entire childhood. And I the think. best character and also Amanda Tree. Yes. <laughs> I, I never went full macabre, but like I was trying to master the deadpan and just could not hit the level that Wednesday does in this movie. She delivers such funny lines and doesn't even blink. And it's great. It is um, so great. And I'll going in all i could remember i was like the scene where she electrocutes her brother there's a scene where she electrocutes her brother but she introduces because she invites him over to sit in her homemade electric chair because <laughs> she has a homemade electric chair as any kid has. and he just looks at her like what are we doing and she goes we're playing a game it's called 
is there a God? <laughs> I was like, he delivers that. That was so the good. one line I remembered from this movie so clearly. It was just, oh my God, that moment where she electrocutes her brother is called, is there a God? I, I know. I, I remember that scene, but did not remember how epic that line was. <laughs> I mean, to me, Wednesday was also just the epitome of doesn't every older sister want to strap their little brother into an electric chair of course they do <laughs> so i'd forgotten or yeah there was no way to remember it for me maybe but uh after she starts doing it the look on christina ricci's face like it just she looks so maniacally delighted that she's <laughs> kind of killing her brother and i don't know if you've watched she's on a show now called yellow jackets I haven't um, watched that yet. Fantastic. Yeah. But she plays this psychopath of a nurse. And mm. there's a scene where one of her old friends like mm -hmm. knocks on her door and basically says, hey, we need help with a body. And she makes that same face just like, oh, oh <laughs> me? Oh, oh, like delighted. Like, oh, we get to kill someone. It's just <laughs> such an goody. epic Christina Ricci face. And I swear to God. Like she's going to win an award for playing like some crazy ax murderer someday for that facial expression. It's such a perfect face. And just the whole thing, the game of, is there a God? That one went a, a little over my kids' heads in a way because they're like, what does she mean? Like they didn't even make the connection. Perhaps our religious education has not been uh, that good. But because um, I, I like howled with laughter at that. <laughs> Oh watching. God. I was like, oh my God, this is funny. I the even... other one that got me too at the end, uh, the bad guys ultimately get like electrocuted and thrown from the house and just land perfectly in these previously dug graves. And Wednesday and her brother are just standing there with the shovels. And oh, yeah, he, this is funny. he turns to her and says, Are they dead? And she just looks at him and goes, Does it matter? I know. And the delivery it was is amazing. I forgot amazing. about that. And it's... <laughs> It's so funny. <laughs> it is so funny. I mean, she was the character to me, like lives on even even without the fact that there's like a Netflix show now. I mean, I think the memory of that character is and like you were saying earlier, the fact that that kind of was a theme in that era in the 90s in terms of some tweeny female characters that are sort of like that. But Christina Ricci is it is just unreal i mean it was like you're totally right that part at the end again i think i held with laughter oh my god um, I, think, I think at that point my daughter like turned around and be like what are they doing <laughs> um, but they're kind of murdering someone and it's funny it's funny and uh, not to dwell on it too much but i was before i started watching wednesday the netflix show the the actress who plays wednesday in that show um talked about that you know how it was really intimidating because for those who don't know, Christina Ricci is also in the Wednesday show, but she does not play Wednesday. And so the actress who actually is playing Wednesday is having to now do these scenes as Wednesday in with front of Christina, Christina Ricci. Ricci. talked about how it was kind of intimidating to be directed to be very deadpan when like Christina Ricci is standing right there, <laughs> like watching her play this. So it's crazy. So she definitely was my favorite character as a kid. She's still maybe my co-favorite character now. Like I just thought she's somehow so adorable and so menacing at the same time it's just fantastic so it is fantastic I mean and there's there's kind of like I think the well-known classic line that she has when again when they're trying to make money and after the, the not the jig is up but basically they, they decided to scam so the lawyer and um the clients, one of them being uh, Gordon slash Fester and his mom basically kicked the Adams family out of the house. And they're basically like, he's basically taking the inheritance. And so they're living, there's really the Schitt's Creek <laughs> part of yeah. the Schitt's Creek part of the movie. And every, every family member is trying to make money in their own way. So Wednesday and her brother are selling lemonade and she has an interaction with the the girl selling Girl Scouts when the girl selling Girl Scouts is like, well, is it made from real lemons? And at some point in the conversation, Wednesday's like, uh, ask about the Girl Scout cookies. Are they made? Yeah, from she offers the barter. Oh, she offers a barter. Oh, that's right. Because yeah, it was barter. barter the lemonade for the cookies, and yeah, right. she delivers that line. Yeah, but only are they made from real Girl Scouts? It was like amazing. <laughs> that one got laughs from my kids. It still stood the test of time for how funny that is. <laughs> the thing I like about it is, 
or my interpretation of it is that Wednesday knows exactly what she's saying in all these moments. Like, I think Morticia genuinely is just trying to be nice and comes across as super weird when she says things like, oh, That's he's true. too young to eat. Um, <laughs> but I think Wednesday when she's asking, like, are the Girl Scout cookies made of real Girl Scouts? Like, she knows she's about to upset this person and she's doing it on purpose. And yeah. Then getting pleasure out of it too. And yeah. and like doesn't even care then that she's not making the money in her lemonade stand. She's going to get this girl's gut. <laughs> so maybe she's the sociopath here. I love it. <laughs> I think it's a pretty easy point A to point B to think that Wednesday Adams is a sociopath. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Oh, but so yeah. funny. All so right. Fun. There's a, uh, other family members here who they get less lines, less scenes. Like Pugsley doesn't get to talk until I think halfway through the movie. And he's sort of he, a nothing character. He's yeah. really a setup guy for Wednesday. Like definitely. Yeah. He, Pugsley he, is definitely the setup guy for Wednesday. hundred percent. That actor didn't really go on to do anything after this. I think he was just a one time or not one time. They made a few of these movies, but he was a child actor for this. And went on to live the rest of his life as Pugsley Adams. <laughs> retired <laughs> setup man for Christina Ricci. <laughs> yeah, the grandmama character who pops up, she's got a funny occasional one-liners or like you just see her doing weird things like when she's in the background cooking with a copy of Grey's Anatomy. Like that's super weird. <laughs> I know that is pretty funny. And and again, those were things that as an adult I noticed now that I didn't notice before. And like you know, they cook like gross things obviously oh, as one like does still living episode. food on the plates and Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then you've got uh, Lurch, who's the butler, which he had that famous line from the TV show, You Rang, but they don't let this Lurch talk at all. So. I, yeah, no, totally. He's still nothing. funny, though. I mean, he's walking around in like the little maid's apron at one point, and he just does deadpan stares at everyone when they do something inappropriate. And he's talking with his face a lot. He is. I mean, sort of a not, he's just sort of part of the tapestry of how weird they are in a way and doesn't really do much uh for me it's just sort of there i mean the, the I, main thing is are, are the four family members i think yeah. but, i yeah. do have some nostalgia for lurch because uh, a high school boyfriend of mine used to refer to my father as lurch when he opened the door <laughs> it was the height thing frankly i think yeah i mean i think there's also you know the others it's not really a side character but dan hedaya who played tully the lawyer i don't know if i'm pronouncing his name right but um you know I'll, he basically plays always like a classic sleazeball so except in clueless when he's the dad oh that's right he was the dad in clueless i totally forgot about that although he's but a he, lawyer in that too i guess so oh he is a lawyer in True clueless. type that's so funny he also played so i just remembered him as the husband from Bet first Miller's wives club. club first wives club yes yeah which like you know he's like an endearing sleazeball again he, i he, think he's just uh, kind of the setup man yeah i mean gomez just abuses and abuses him so yeah you could there's see nothing why. i didn't even remember that character from when i was a kid like it, had, it was like a non-entity to me um as a kid and i think for my kids do when they watched uh they, it was just like i don't know there's just this goofball keeps getting like stabbed by gomez when they sword fight essentially <laughs> So yeah, even even the house when like at the beginning when Angelica Houston's and keep calling her Angelica Houston, Morticia, <laughs> whatever, they're the same person, is like going through the closet. You know, she's in. Yeah, you're right. Oh, she's going through the goodness, house, and funny. it's like there's like cobwebs and stuff, and there's stuff everywhere, and it's probably all valuable. And she's like, oh, Uncle Knickknacks hiking gear. Oh, Uncle Knickknacks this. And then she's reading the labels, and then she finally gets to one. And she goes. Uncle Nick Nat. And then and you look and it. it's clearly a body. Like there is the shape of a head <laughs> that's been duct taped to the bag. <laughs> it's like, oh, Uncle Nick <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. Like anything moving through the house is sort of fun. That house of horrors in a way. Yeah. But fun horrors. Yeah. Tons of fun to watch them just anytime they're in movement through the house. It's tons of fun to watch anytime you see the children torturing each other. And it's usually Wednesday torturing Pugsley, but obviously. Just, few reversal scenes where like he has her tied to a chair at one point and it's like stuffing ar arsenic or something down her <laughs> oh i totally don't even remember that it's just going on in the background like fester's making a phone call and you just see like pugsley running at her with a bottle of poison <laughs> <She's> like, <laughs> what is happening so yeah it's i just kids it's so not even that. yeah it's not so much like how we're advancing the plot in these scenes it's all these little details in the background that make my favorite scenes so funny when they're outside of the house in the real world, that is the 
Schitt's Creek moment, I think, is less appealing because they're just like so clearly in the 90s. And when they're in the house, they're it could be any time. It could be the 1800s. It could be today. Like they're just so in their own element. Yeah. But when they go to the motel, it's like there's MC Hammer music playing everywhere. Which is which is terrible, by there's, the way. Yeah. Oh, oh this, yeah. the, he wrote a theme song for this movie and it won the Razzie for worst song that year. I mean, it was <laughs> so cringy. Bad. Even re you know, sometimes you rewatch old movies and you're like, this song's good. I forgot about this song. Not so with this one. <laughs> <laughs> this song makes the ninja rap from Ninja Turtles 2 that Vanilla Ice did look like oh. a work of art. So <laughs> it's really bad. But but I kind of agree that Adam's family outside of their element, and we referenced other funny scenes like with the Girl Scouts and the and, and Morticia yeah. teaching pre-K. Those things are funny, but them out of their element, you sort of then like yeah, the Shit's Creek shtick, if you will, doesn't really hold. <laughs> Yeah, and Gomez the, the is daytime kind of the daytime talk shows. I know <laughs> Gomez is like calling into the Sally Jesse Raphael show, and she's like, "Stop calling, Mr. Adams." Which I actually I laughed. I thought that was funny, but my kid my kids were like, "Who the hell is that?" <laughs> you know, my kids. There was this woman. I know the there show were these talk shows was that popular. was trashy. It was the nineties. Don't worry about very it. Very <laughs> red glasses. You and I probably agree that outside of the house, the favorite scene is when they go to the children's school for the recital all the reactions that they have to watching a school concert because they're not wrong they are not wrong they are ever like i feel i even felt Just... an adult watching this re-watching it so basically they're going the, the 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 plot if you will is that gomez um <clears throat> fester is not going because or they that's the whole idea is that Morticia and Gomez are going to the recital therefore the house is empty and Gomez and Fester can go and like steal shit but the actual recital itself is sort of just it's them out of their their element but in the funniest way and it is all parents watching it as an adult I was like oh my god it's pain it's it that's exactly what it's like a documentary this is how painful that is. their facial expressions while they're watching some other class of children sing getting to know you and the kids are singing in the most annoying way possible <laughs> it's, like, it's extra annoying but watching <laughs> the Adams family's faces looking at each other catching each other's eyes like kill me this is the worst and I think right we've, <laughs> we've all been there <laughs> I know it's like every time it's like the kids are like we're gonna put on a play for you it's like oh god great <laughs> great oh that's special I know the painful yeah you're totally right they are not wrong that is that is a very relatable moment to all adults <laughs> yeah it's a completely silent scene from the adults part they're just acting with their faces and it's perfect <laughs> and just and you know sort of as expected the what pugsley and wednesday do is they basically do a sword fight and have fake blood and it's like super gory and gruesome and and really good effects i know uncle fester yeah, helped yeah. them with that but man they're spraying gallons of fake blood oh, presumably oh fake blood all over presumably who knows like they should have worn the front two rows of the audience to get those like uh, the ponchos the ponchos like you have at a, a gallagher performance or at sea world or something i mean if i were a parent and i wasn't in the splash zone of that performance i would have been on my feet like yes that just <laughs> yes. got epic Oh, it's amazing. It's so funny. Again, you have like the most relatable thing, like, oh, something crazy happened. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So my other favorite scene outside of the house is the, I guess it's in the house though, is Gomez and Morticia going to therapy. Although I think it's more Gomez. Um, and he's in therapy because Fester doesn't remember things. And Gomez is feeling like, is he really my brother? Why don't, why, why isn't it like, what's going on here? Which is like sort of a fun, funny setup, like send up of therapy. But, and you know, they settle on like uh, displacement, uh, whatever that means. I don't even know if that's a real term in terms of the, the therapist who's actually the con artist is trying to convince Gomez that it's all in his head. And then of course, Fester is real and that he's suffering from displacement. And, and it's just, the whole scene is just funny. I mean, even like little throwaway lines when the therapist is like, well, did you love your mother? And he responds, Gomez says, I love my mother. It was an accident. And, <laughs> and like, then it's like nothing. Like they don't explain how the mother died. They don't explain the accident. It's just sort of assumed that he somehow was involved in his mother's death. <laughs> 
funny send up of therapy because yeah, she's not a real therapist. So they're just making stuff up, but she's doing it in like a German Eastern European accent or bad one. <laughs> and yeah, like, I think that's our stereotype of therapy back in the nineties. I mean, another thing to talk about, which I, you know, was definitely noticed at least by my, my 10 year old was the, the sexual nature of, of, I'm just going to say Raul Julia and Angelica Houston, but of the Gomez and Morticia character. I mean, it is over the top flirty and sexual to the point where I don't, I think it feeling is an element of embarrassment. Yeah. I don't remember feeling uncomfortable about that when I saw it as a kid. And I think because you're Wednesday because Adams. Well, yeah. I'm very <laughs> cynical. Um, no, I think they just don't show where it's going. It's all implied. So I think That's in the true. adult mind we're taking it to its uh furthest possible place because that's they true care, they definitely have like more fetishes than we could probably well like you said like we we stretch on thursdays yeah we, <laughs> or whatever on tuesdays we use the rack on thursdays uh, you don't know what they're doing at that auction they go to a charity oh auction God. and that bid auction. on their own item and keep outbidding each other and then it just sounds like they're doing something dirty in front of everyone but they don't show it you just essentially see the facial expressions <laughs> said what are they doing like he <laughs> which then maybe tell laugh. you when you're older <laughs> no it definitely still worked for me as an adult it's all funny and you get a ton of funny lines from the two of them about it too that's so good and i think morticia at some point when she's i think this must be in the shit's creek time when they're not in the house anymore and she's sort of lamenting and oh he coughs up blood but not like he used to like and it's <laughs> It might be when they're still in the house. I don't know. No, like I, the whole thing is funny. That's an out of the house moment. <laughs> they do it a little bit on Wednesday too. I had, since I had just rewatched the Adams Family before I watched the, the Netflix show Wednesday, I, to me, it didn't land as much for Wednesday. Cause it was like, I don't really want to see them making out like that. Cause no. that's not the, that's, that wasn't the fun part. It was just all the funny throwaway lines and everything implied in the Adams Family, in the movie. Um, yeah. That the show just did not, it just didn't land for me, the modern version. I didn't but. think those two actors had as much chemistry. The and Angelica now. Houston and Raul Julia chemistry is off the charts. They're, off the charts, totally. Like the way they just look at each other is astounding. So I think... <laughs> It works more in this movie than it did in the TV show. It felt like I could have watched an entire show. I mean, which is funny because there's a show now about it. But I could have watched a whole show about the family. Like, the sh sort of like Shit's Creek. Like, the, the shtick, if you will, was still was funny enough. So I almost felt like in the movie, there wasn't enough of it. Like, I, I would want more Wednesday torturing her brother and more Angelica Houston sort of roasting a bunch of normies at all times. I, I, I think I could... <laughs> So I feel like there could have been more of that, I think, would make it a great movie or at least a great series from the 90s. It's weird to judge it now from a modern perspective. But, yeah. You know, this is just getting to the other things. There's just like a like we were saying all along, we've basically spent this whole time talking about the characters because the plot just does not matter. No. <laughs> and, and there's tons of holes in it. It's fester fester, which is like the whole plot, really. But who cares? <laughs> does it matter? <laughs> does it matter? So do uh, we want to talk about if this lives up for us as adults? Yeah, let's do it. So let's start with whether, so now we're going to score it from one to 10, one being garbage, uh, 10 being Princess Bride. Does it live up to us as adults? I'm going to ask you to go first and then I'll go. You can probably tell. I think this lives up for, I enjoyed watching this again as an adult. But it don't was... give away whether you think it lives up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, this is just funny and charming and so weird and just yeah, it took me to great nostalgic places, but I think even if I saw it for the first time today, I would find it funny. And yeah, so I'm going to give this, let's You're give it an eight. eight. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that is tied for your highest ranking. Not that it matters, but you gave Who Framed Roger Rabbit an eight as well. I did. You did. I guess I, and I have been given this feedback that I am a harsh, harsh scorer in person. But I think the numbers forward. show that. So I think in my logic, it has to at least be a five because it, it was fun to rewatch. Um, and it's in, in a way, and as an adult, I did laugh at parts that surprised me um, that I didn't pick up on as a kid, like all of Angelica Houston's throwaway lines. But I essentially, it lived up as an adult to me really on the strength of Christina Ricci, Raul Julia and Angelica Houston. So it had to be above a five, but I couldn't go as high as an eight. So I, w I went with a seven. There's great movies out there that 
this is not Casablanca. So like, yeah, this is definitely not. And I, I am, skewed. this is my, also tied for my second, my highest ranking. Cause I also gave who framed Roger Rabbit a seven. And I, I would say that who framed Roger Rabbit is a better movie, but that doesn't necessarily matter here. I think that it's a seven because it's definitely a, just the strength of, the, of enough of the characters and whether that's my nostalgia for them or just the strength of the actors, I don't know. <laughs> um, all right. So we have, right. that's a 15 total. So that ties, it's a ties for first place in terms all of right. our adult ranking. So what about, so our second scoring again, one to 10. So does it live up to kids? Would it live up to kids today or at least its intended audience, which I think it's intended audience is honestly adults. I, I mean, tween, we could yeah, like it a teenage tween, crowd. Right? Yeah, like a teenage crowd for sure. Because you have yeah. to be old enough to understand that deadpan humor. I mean, obviously, I watched it with a 10 and five year old and the five year old like thought some parts were funny, but there's, you know, nothing for him otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, I think this does live up for kids. Obviously, not very young kids. There's so many dark jokes about death and the school recital has a lot of blood in it um <laughs> that's okay kids don't mind blood <laughs> or tweens like don't. little little kids do but like for I, I think it doesn't get old to feel like the outsider you know there's something relatable to Wednesday Adams obviously especially for you because you embody her <laughs> in life <laughs> you're like you're like pouring oil over the carolers in your neighborhood um but I don't think it's one by modern standards that kids would go or teenagers would go back and watch again and again. I, I think mm, there was, okay. I think, it, so in my mind, again, my mind, again, I went at least a five because I think it has to, there's definitely something there. There's something enjoyable about them as outcasts, if you will, but that's where it ended. And I, I think I'm just not sure I can go above a five. Okay. I think. I think it's right down the middle for its intended audience now. Um, I feel like I might be in the minority here with my harshness. You kind <laughs> so of, you're talking me down to a seven, actually, for I? kids. Because oh, I'm no. just thinking back on how I didn't really follow the plot that doesn't exist when I was a kid. And hmm. Wow. Yeah, I might, I'm going to lower to a seven. It's not you're significant. To a seven. That's not significant, highest. but I'm lowering to a seven for kids. But if it makes you feel better, it's still your highest. It's still my highest for well, kids. It's still, it's still your highest. So that's a, let me do a quick math. That's a 12 for kids. So 27. So I think that's our highest scoring movie so far. It is. Yeah. And I think like for kids, I don't mean to be so harsh with a five. I actually was thinking that if, if you actually remade that movie today, in a way, sort of how Netflix's show does. I think that that could very well land in the teenage audience and sort of has some of the same elements in a way. So I th maybe perhaps I had the Netflix show on my mind because I'm like, this could be done in a way, like mm. the characters themselves live on because they're so good, uh, but maybe not the 1991 version as much. Yeah. I'm not talking, I'm not trying to talk you down from a seven. It's still, nope. we're still I'm a solid seven. I'm 12 total seven. for kids. So this final one, I actually usually ahead of time will write what I think. And I didn't because, um, and this, the final question for folks, this is, it's a yay, and nay, yay or nay. We both have to agree whether it lives up and we have been split before. Yes, we have. <laughs> so for this one, I just don't know. And we've basically spent this whole time gushing about the movie. And in a way it was fun to rewatch for those reasons that the strength of the performances and how funny Morticia is and how good the chemistry is between Raul Julia and Angelica Houston and how endearing Fester is. Like, we want an uncle like Fester. I just don't know. I really, really want it to live up. And I'm just not sure if my nostalgia has just, like, overtaken me here. Mm. So I think I, I, want, I want you to convince me either way. Well, let's, <laughs> you can. let's reverse engineer this. What wouldn't live up, do you think? Aside um, from MC Hammer, his... Oh my god, yeah, that definitely didn't. That song is horrible. I guess because the ultimately the plot didn't matter. I, I think I'm sort of stuck on that, that the plot doesn't matter and it's really just the Adams family that's fun. That I'm I kind of struggle with that. Yet at the same time, I enjoyed the family so much. But I guess the ultimate question is like it, it you know, would you want to rewatch this? And I'm sort of torn. Because a part of me wants to be like, yeah, definitely. But then it's like, sure, rewatch it. But just you're rewatching it for Angelica Houston and Christina Ricci and Val Julia. That's what you're watching it for, which might be OK. Yeah. I mean, they make the movie. <laughs> yeah. So are you what? what is your verdict? I, I think I know the verdict. Yeah, but... this definitely lives up for me. Just even <laughs> turning it on and watching them 
throw the hot oil from the cauldron onto the Christmas carolers. It just <laughs> from moment one. Yeah, it just made from me killing Christmas carolers. That's why it looks up for you. It just made me very happy to watch this again. And yeah, the humor is so dark. All those jokes I'd forgotten about made me laugh again. And yeah, just absolutely delighted that this exists. It's so silly. It's so silly. I mean, I think that I, I'm easily pushed to the camp where I'm I'm going to say, yeah, it looks woo-hoo. good. So woo-hoo. All right. we are in agreement. We are not split. We uh, have but the second ever yeah, <laughs> out of you four are... reviews. But <laughs> congratulations, Adam's family from 1991. You joined Who Framed Roger Rabbit. As... As movies that live up from our childhoods. <laughs> yes. Um yeah, no, I think I think I, it's like I wanted to be convinced. I wanted you to convince me <laughs> that it lived up. And the more we talked about it, I'm like, I just there's just no match for some of these fun characters and performances. It's and for folks listening, you should rewatch it. And I <laughs> yeah, rewatch it just for that. And I'm kind of curious if you think that we were too generous or, or maybe... too, too smitten with Angelica Houston's performance. <laughs> Yes, there's <laughs> again. There's only one gay person in this podcast. I thought we were smitten with Raul Julia too. I mean, we're smitten cool. with him. He's charming. He is charming. Yeah. Yeah. We'll 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 take him tangoing away in his uh, with the rose in his teeth. Yes. <laughs> uh, let us know if you agree or disagree or think we were too generous with this one. You could um, find us on all the socials at Live Up Pod. You can send us an email at liveuppod at gmail I'd love to know what you think. And I think we do have some feedback from folks. We have our young listener criticizing uh, co-host Amanda Treat for um, calling Santa a dick. It was more of a a shocking moment. (laughs) I washed my mouth out with soap. We're all okay okay. here. For the young listeners, Amanda did wash her her mouth out with soap. And um, we had another listener who thought I was a bit harsh on reindeer. And I think felt that if I had just, you know, in a year's time, if I rewatch it again, I might change my mind. And I think his line was that his nostalgia glasses fell into his martini when he heard how hard it was. (laughs) Oh, dear God, he gets. But see, Um, Jess, this is how that movie gets you. You watch it over and over and over (laughs) again. And it's like joining a cult. Like it slowly gets into your brain and then you're stuck there. Yes. Yeah, so that's, you know, and that, that person was, um, yeah. So Jason Roby, who told me that I was harsh. Sorry, man. All right. Well, we'll see you guys. Talk to you guys in a few weeks with our next episode. It's going oh, to yeah, be a wait, surprise. Oh yeah. Wait, what the next episode is? Is it a we surprise? We don't know what it is yet. Oh, okay. It's a surprise. I was it's like, what surprise. is it, Amanda? <laughs> okay. I can pick one, but I think it's your turn. Okay. All right. Bye everybody. Thanks everyone.